Hello. 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 Look at that. Hello. How are we, ladies and gentlemen? Um, I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners and sovereign custodians of the land on which we meet today, the Wurundjeri Woi Wurrung people of the Eastern Kulin Nations, and I'd like to pay my respects to the ancestors and elders past and present. Considering the subject matter, um, I'd also like to recognise First Nations people, a wisdom and knowledge of language, music, communication and culture, which has been practised for thousands of years and generations. I extend my respect to all First Nations people who are with us here today, in person or joining uh, online remotely. Uh, it always was and always will be Aboriginal land, now especially more than ever. Um, my name is Owen Gonsalves, uh, that's G-O-N-S-A-L-V-E-S. Um, I am from Sin. Who's heard of Sin Media before? We've got some woos. I didn't even ask you to woo and you wooed. That's great. We love the interaction. Now throw your hands up again. Who's, who's heard of Sin Media? Who's like heard of it, right? Um, who's listened to Sin Media before? Um, amazing. Awesome. Cool. So we got a few people that know. Yeah, nice. Awesome. Uh, well, if you don't know, SIN is a radio station and media organisation which is run by and for young people uh, like most of us in the room today. Um, so, uh, yeah, most. There's some, there's some people here who probably don't meet the 12 to 26 age demographic. Um, <laughs> um, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm on a few shows with SIN. Um, you can find me on most uh, of the day on a Sunday. Um, I do a show called The Four Bar Pass, uh, which is a long-form interview segment. I do a show called Soul Food, which is uh, about R&B and soul music. Um, yeah, me too. It's fantastic stuff. Yep. Oh, I appreciate it. That's awesome. Awesome, yeah. Um, I also do a show called The Hip Hop Show, which is uh, about hip hop, um, as it says on the tin. Um, I also do a show called Sunday Sweets, which is uh, Sin's feature. Maybe most of you might have heard of that one. Uh, it's essentially where we go through the high rotation playlist that plays on Sin, Sin's airwaves during the week, talk about it, plug some of these great artists, and yeah. So uh, I'm also on 1700 as well. So I'm doing a lot. I'm doing plenty. Um, for those of you who may not know, I'm not going to talk about it too much, but uh, I wanted to quickly mention it. Sin is unfortunately potentially facing closing its doors in the next within the next month or so. Um, it's unfortunately facing a bit of a rough time at the moment. Um, so if you want to find out more about that, make sure you follow Sin Media at Sin underscore Media. Um, on Instagram, and there's plenty of stuff you can find out more about it there and how to support Sin uh, during this time of crisis because um, we definitely need your help. Uh, Sin doesn't run without the young folks. Um, so, yeah, I do have plenty of stuff within the music itself. So I'm on these shows, I'm interviewing artists like the lovely some of the lovely folks we have here today. Um, I'm also interviewing um, you know, managers, PR people, um, anyone I can get my hands on, really. Um, so, yeah, so it's fantastic stuff. I'm very, very honoured to be facilitating this conversation today um, around funding your music career. Um, so very, very excited to get stuck in. Before I do, um, hopefully most of you here know what The Push is, but if you're uh, watching at home and you don't know what The Push is, The Push is a youth uh, music organisation that have been around for about over 30 years, uh, delivering programmes for young people to develop their skills and uh, music industry networking uh, and things like that as well. Push runs uh, a lot of amazing masterclasses. Put your hand up if you've been to one of these masterclasses before. Oh, great. It's so like most of you. That's it. Awesome. So you already know what you're in for. Fantastic. Amazing. Uh, the masterclass series is, of course, being held by the Push as part of their mission to give every young person an opportunity to participate and thrive in music. Um, great. So we've got some fantastic guests here that I'll introduce in just a second. But before we do, I just want to have a bit of housekeeping. Um, it's not a long list. This is not all housekeeping, I, I promise you. Can you imagine if it was, though? That'd be crazy. Um, uh, so, super simple stuff. Our bathrooms are located around the left there, so you want to head down the hall, follow all the signs, uh, and you'll get a um, all-gendered toilets. Oh, thanks so much, Kim. Um, all-gendered toilets. Um, our emergency exits uh, are through that way and out the front doors that you came in today as well. Uh, Lisa uh, Lorenz uh, will be our um, first aid officer for the event. Do we have Lisa in the room right now? Lisa's over there. That's yeah, that's Lisa. So if there's any issues, let Lisa know. Um, of course, you've helped yourself to some snacks already, but if at any point you want to get up and grab a, 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 che a cheesel or a cookie, by all means, um, help yourself to some snacks. Uh, this session, of course, is happening in person. You wouldn't be here if it wasn't, and also virtually. Uh, so hello to everyone joining online. Uh, I haven't clocked where the camera is, which is unprofessional of me, but hello either way. Uh, great to have your participation uh, this evening. 
Uh, we want to learn about what interests all of you in the room and our folks at home. So we're asking you to ask questions. So there are some QR codes around the room. You'll find them. It's a little bit dark, uh, so you may have to use the address underneath, which is the push.com uh, dot, uh, push dot, the push.au slash M-I-M Slido. So Slido is S-L-I-D-O. Uh, so that's M-I-M-S-L-I-D-O. Uh, you can scan those QR codes and you can submit your questions anonymous, anonymously there. Um, of course, we'll potentially get some from people in the room as well, if need be. Um, what else we got? Uh, with that being said, because we are doing some stuff online and we are answering some questions from online as well, um, I've got the Slido app on my phone, so I'll be looking down at that uh, just to answer some questions uh, when we get to that stage. So just don't mind me if you see me looking at my phone. I promise I'm not on Instagram. Um, I already did my social plugs. I'm good. I'm fine. Um, great. That's pretty much it. Awesome. Let's get right and suck into it. We have three absolutely incredible, talented, incredibly talented guests here with us today. Uh, I'm going to uh, toot some horns and go through them uh, each by each. I wish they sat in order, but that's okay. That was my bad. So we'll, we'll just introduce them out of order. We'll break the rules today. Um, we have Beatrice Lewis. Beatrice, you want to wave? <laughs> woo! Woo! -hoo. Beatrice is an electronic music producer, songwriter, and performer. Uh, she's also a producer for Haiku Hands. Throw your hands up if you heard of. Throw your hands up if you heard of Haiku Hands. Amazing. We got a few. Oh, heaps, heaps of people. Great. Um, uh, she's also uh, a producer for Karada Jala Kiridara. Have I said that right, Beatrice? Not too bad. No, or <laughs> butchered it. Amazing. Karada Jala Kiridara. Amazing. There you go. Thank you so much for that. Um, and, uh, of course, they're a solo artist as well. Uh, they've been uh, a composer and workshop facilitator, do plenty of things in music. Um, and yeah, so Haiku Hands themselves have toured around uh, the world, Europe extensively, and also has done a, a lot of sold-out uh, Australian shows. Uh, and recently had a breakout performance at South by Southwest. Not the one happening right now, uh, but the one I imagine last year or recently. Uh, and they've also had a, done a bunch of uh, U.S. states as well. So Beatrice has got plenty of insight into funding music career, and we'll chat to her about some stuff uh, this evening for sure. We also have Joel Ma. Joel, give us a wave. <laughs> you may know Joel uh, as his stage name, which is Joelistics. Joel, have I said that one right? You have. Amazing. <laughs> Nailed it. That's one today. Um, he's a producer, artist, songwriter, multi-instrumentalist, uh, rapper, actor, poet, theater maker, and activist. Joel, have I listed everything? Uh, father? Father. The yeah. most important one, mind you. The most important one. Um, and he's also founded uh, an alt rap group called Sue. TZU. TZU. I'm, oh, I'd assume yeah. so. There you go. There you go. Good stuff. Um, <laughs> he's worked with a bunch of artists as well. Um, most, um, most notably uh, Madonna. Shout out Hung Up. What a, what a tune. Um, also uh, Haiku Hands. Van Vitti Van Vitti Vitti, yes, yeah. amazing, yes. Uh, I was just referring to the fact that I love Hung Up as a song. Oh, that right, was just me. I was like, yeah. don't, don't, I can't take No. I mean, <laughs> maybe you can. Who's going really to stop you? Who's going to stop you? Also worked with Moju and Emma Donovan as well. Was actually on the board for the push. Is that right, Joel? I was, yep. yeah. Yeah? So look at that. There you go. Have full circle. Amazing. Yeah. Good stuff. Uh, we also have Kim Williamson. Kim, give us a wave. Um, I made you wave even though you were definitely the last person I had to introduce, uh, but <laughs> we enjoyed the wave regardless. Um, Kim is an artist, manager, grant writer, and music strategist. Uh, she's worked with a bunch of artists and collective studios, uh, promoters, and festivals on things like fundraising, marketing, and also has a particular interest in video and dance. She currently works on and produces creative works on half a dozen musical projects. Um, it's exciting stuff. Um, and she's also currently a development manager uh, of Western Edge, uh, working with young people, uh, young artists across Melbourne's West. Um, and that's our lineup. We'll give them a round of applause, folks. Thank you. We haven't done anything yet. No, but they're about to do we plenty. We're food. about to do plenty. We're about to get stuck in. Uh, please make sure, again, uh, you're referring to those QR codes or you're going to go into the push.au slash MIM Slido, uh, which is the web address uh, to answer some uh, to ask some questions, sorry. Um, and we'll get stuck into those very shortly. Uh, but just to kick things off here, we're talking about uh, funding your music career as a topic today. Um, so I want to sort of broach out to the panel here um, to kick us off, just a bit of an icebreaker. Um, I'll, I'll get each of you to give us a little, <coughs> a little bit of a story to recall your first paid opportunity uh, doing the thing you love specifically. Um, so maybe not your retail job, unless you love that, I suppose. 
Um, and of course, how maybe a bit of an insight into how much you went home with that day on that first ever payday working in the creative work. So I'll, I'll go to Joel first on, on the end there. Um, so uh, big. I'm probably a bit older than um, most people in this room. I'm probably a bit older than I look, actually. I think it's, it's the half Asian genes. It's the Asian don't raise He's actually factor. 150. I'm actually Yoda level age <laughs> when it comes to the Australian music industry. Um, but so my first time getting paid for a gig was in the early 2000s, I think like 2002. And I was in a band called Pan, which was um, a kind of mix of hip hop and funk and reggae and dub and dance music and we actually talked our way into playing a show at what is now Boney is it still Boney Boney is that or has uh, it changed hands again I think it has changed it has, hands I don't, it? Yeah, think I, I don't think it's Boney anymore anyway an inner city club which can fit about 100 people in the room and somehow we I, I want to say in my memory because this is in you know this is now roughly 20 years ago in my memory we walked up and we'd just come from busking and the one of the promoters said, are you guys the band? And we went, yes, yes, we are the band. And we sort of just basically talked our way into playing a live show with um, a... I had a MC505, which is this horrible groove box from the early 2000s. And and we had some djembes. This is how old <laughs> this is how old this shit is. When it was still okay to have djembes. And we played a show and we got paid, I think, 50 bucks between four of us. And so I... I remember thinking that was rad and um, that was the first paid gig I ever did so in Melbourne. So I did what I loved. It taught me that music is food for the soul and you were going to peren perennially get underpaid. Joel, can, can I ask, um, did it cost you more to get to the gig than it did the amount you were paid? <laughs> Uh, no, I was living in a share house in Carnegie and I nice. believe we just took the train home. Or did we walk? You know, back in that Profit. day we just, we walked probably. Nice. Yeah. Sick. Profit. I think we probably, I think all of the money would have been spent on uh, pizza at the end of the night. That's so, a good way to spend yeah. your first payday to be honest with you. 100%. Uh, I think I spent my first payday on pizza as well actually. Yeah. It's a common thing. We're going to have some pizza at some point as well I believe today. So um, we'll, we'll get stuck into the pizza. Shout out point. the pizza. Shout out pizza. <laughs> Shout out, Peter. How good is it? Um, I might, might go down the line here. So, B, do you want to? Um, I was just remembering um, when I w first got into making music on Ableton, which is the music program that I use. I um, was studying vocals at NMIT, studying jazz and contemporary vocals, and I got cysts on my vocal cords and um, really broke my voice in not a great way and I was started playing cello because I was like, oh, it's the same, similar register to a voice and um, then I was like, oh, I want to get all these loop pedals for my cello and my friend Fred was like, no, you should get a computer and get this thing called Ableton because it has all the loop pedals in the computer and I was like, whoa. So I got it and then all I wanted to do was make beats after that. So I um, made a little EP and... Uh, printed it onto a CD and then painted the EP cover and I hand wrote an application to Creative Victoria for a grant for a thousand dollars and I got that grant. Um, no one had ever heard music that I'd made before. Um, no one ever. Like it was only in my headphones and so getting that was a real booster and um, I remember I met one of the panel ladies later and they said that they were just so touched. They were like, they thought it was like, they're like, that's the sweetest thing, this handwritten application. Don't handwrite it now. It would not be accepted. <laughs> um, so, yeah, that was the first time I remember getting paid for music that I'd made and it blew my mind. Like, so then I got it mixed and, you know, then I applied for a festival called Folk Rhythm and Life and I got accepted to that festival and, oh, they did not pay me. <laughs> uh, <laughs> <laughs> Imagine if we just sat here and called out all the festivals yeah. that we haven't been paid by. And then these guys. <laughs> no, we're not going to do that. Um, but that was a really amazing moment for me. That's really cool. We're going to talk a bit about grant writing as well. Uh, yeah. What are my next yeah. guests uh, as we go through this this session here? Um, quickly, uh, B, is that, is that first EP still around? Is it uploaded on, on No, platforms? I never put it out. No? No, never put it out, which I regret. It? Yeah, I do. 
maybe we can get like a little throwback, maybe a remastered edition. Yeah. Of the that would be sick. <laughs> totally. Be yeah, it's I would so to cute. It. Uh, it's ukulele and. Oh, that's yeah. adorable. That's <laughs> genuine. Really I love cute. how everyone went, oh, <laughs> as soon as ukulele was mentioned. That's always the most adorable instrument. Yeah. Um, hey, Kim, uh, you do a bit do of work. I, do I answer the same question or a different yeah, question? Yeah, let's do it. Uh, we'll, we'll sort of we'll fin- finesse You've it been a little paid? bit. <laughs> oh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> <good question. laughs> we, we've, uh, we've, we, we'll finesse it a little bit. Uh, you've had some experience as an artist manager of that kind as well. Um, I guess going back to the question, getting paid for something you, you love to do, uh, especially, especially in the creative industry, is there was there a moment where you were working in something creative and got paid for it and did that moment stick out to you at all? Yeah, so um, I don't really remember... Um, much of the um, the early sort of sure. ran- there were so many random things I did as an, in, in music, but one of the ones that stick out that were kind of early. I have a little music marketing agency called Melbourne Minute um, with my friend Emerald McGill, who I think has done workshops with the Push as well on more on the video side. And um, early on, we were engaged to do a marketing campaign for the Norwegian Eurovision um, That's group. Incredible. Uh, for this minuscule amount of money. I think we didn't even know how much to charge. And it was like not ev- it was like a tokenistic amount of money. But we were very <laughs> excited about about story writing, uh, storytelling and narrative and viral moments. And so we kind of crafted this viral-ish vertical video that was like quite engaging. And we, um, you know, did this little campaign all over Australia uh, for a relatively tiny amount of money. And they ended up getting full points from Australia, 12 points. And we were just like... <laughs> that was really exciting. Um, so, yeah, that kind of stuck out, even though that was like... We d- I did feel like we didn't quite know what we were doing in terms of the business side of things or charging for things, but it was really cool to see, yeah, to see how something can kind of impact. Yeah. Well, well, it's a narrative, right? You, you're yeah. going through a journey and finding out things for yourself. And obviously, uh, it's led you here, and you're going to give some insight into some people who, who might be going through that process one day, and there you go. Look at the, look at the full circle moment. We love full circle moments here at The Push, and we, we love it here at these masterclasses as well. Uh, Kim, I'll stick with you quickly, just so we, we delve a little bit. Uh, as we mentioned earlier, Kim is a development manager at Western Edge, uh, who work a lot with young emerging creatives, I suppose. Um, uh, can you talk, uh, speak a little bit to some common sort of financial challenges that young emerging artists, specifically in Melbourne's West, might sort of have and um, and how you work with them to, to overcome them if you do work with them specifically? Totally. I mean, I feel like Melbourne's West is a little bit different as well because sure. there's, um, there's lots of other issues as well around geography, access to uh, maybe more sort of inner city institutions and other forms of access. But I would say in terms of emerging artists, let's say especially emerging musicians, sure. um, yeah, it's always a challenge. You know, funding is always a challenge. Understanding where where the options are in terms of funding things and then what the funding can achieve. Like sometimes I, l- I still want to tell artists that if you've got a song out, you have a song. Like that's all it necessarily means. It doesn't mean you've conquered the world unless maybe it comes along with a bit of a plan, a bit of a strategy, a bit of promotion and other things. Mm. Like if you've got an album, you technically just have an album. So, yeah, I feel like um, definitely financial sort of – the financial challenges are pretty big for emerging artists. Also sometimes just being able to have the ability to stick with music for long enough that you can get some traction and get some support and momentum. Um, Yeah. Did that idea of just sort of like repetition sort of keeping you going? I don't know, not so much repetition. I mean, there's so many things. It's kind of like networks, community, support, friends, having access to friends who are musicians, maybe a bit further along in the path than you, um, having support from organisations like The Push or like other organisations that can make a big difference too. Yeah, I feel like repetition I wouldn't necessarily advise because (laughs) it's like if you do – if you're not necessarily getting the results you want and you keep doing more of the same, that's not necessarily going to move you along. Um, although the more you do something, you do get better at it and you, you know, you learn incrementally. So if you do a couple of releases, you definitely learn and you grow your networks, radio, promo, whatever, you can slowly grow your team. So things are definitely incremental. But in terms of just repetition, I would say I would almost go the opposite, trial and error. Like try something. If that worked, double down on that. If it didn't work, maybe try something else. And, you know, because there's so many different paths you can take as emerging artists. Well, there you go. Hey, um, Joel and Beatrice, as artists on, on the other side of that coin, I suppose, how do you then work out what your work is sort of worth? 
And I suppose what experiences can you guys draw from where you've sort of changed how you negotiate or express the price of your work? Uh, I might go to B first, if that's okay. Uh, yeah. So you go. Oh, you want to speak about it? Yeah. Okay. So we're going to get loud a little bit here. Let's talk about uh, just first of all. If you're looking at an artist's income, I think today you're looking at about <coughs> multiple streams. So you've got gigs, you've got publishing or sync, so music that you might license, you've got merch, you've got possibly educational uh, opportunities, um, you've got grants. So how do you um, know what each one is worth? I think at the beginning you really don't, or well, I didn't, that's for sure. And I still think that more than most industries, music is a hall of mirrors. Like, actually, not many people know what stuff's worth. So, to some degree, it's up to you to define what you're worth and what um, you're going to charge. But, of course, the late-stage capitalism free market tends to offer people who, you know, it'll basically, you'll have opportunities or you won't. And so, I think you know you're doing well when you've got more opportunities, as we were saying on the train, is like, there's more opportunities than you have the time to fill so you can raise your price. Um, of course, you also have your peers who you can check in with and organisations like Music Victoria, The Push, and you can try and find out what a standard of something is worth. But i got to be honest, like much like my first experience of getting paid for music, um, we, we made fuck all and I have done a lot of gigs for fuck all and a lot of performances and events and talking engagements and production workshops and songwriting sessions and f for nothing. But if it's part of a bigger plan and if it's also feeding your soul, then it's worth something. So at a certain point, how to work out what something's worth is also about what does it mean to you? Like, what is it doing for your life? And is it making you a happier person? Is it helping you to express things that you need to get out? Is it networking with people who might be where you're at or a few steps ahead? Are you learning something? You know, there's so many ways to gauge what something's worth. Money is not the best one most of the time, but we all need to pay rent. So at a certain degree, you have to work out, well, I had to work out where do I put my resources and my time to be able to make money and also to be able to feed this passion and let the passion feed itself. And that's an ongoing thing, which, you, again, I don't know if there's a really clear way to answer this question because when I started, the music industry was completely different to what it is today. In fact, I have a theory that the music industry changes every five years. And every five years, certain elements that might have made you money just dry up, I mean, or change, or the, the format changes, CDs go out, you know, suddenly vinyl's back. Gigs used to be great, gigs not so great anymore. You know, like uh, once upon a time you could make money off, you know, brand alignment stuff. I don't know if that's still a thing. Like there's so many changing areas of music and I guess you need to be adaptable. You need to sort of duck and weave with what's changing and where you're at and where your career's at. But what it's worth, um, is always going to be a, a bit of a head game in a way, a little bit like, I think it's worth this, but I think I could ask for this. You know, I mean, it's a, it's why building a team is one of the best things you can do, I think, is like have a team of people who can ask for more than you possibly thought you could ask for, for gigs, I mean, you know, or for a record contract or for publishing. Um, but a team could also be um, exactly like John mentioned, um, calling APRA if you're writing a song and you want to ask about the splits and what's fair. Like there's all these um, organisations which are there to help you answer those questions. Like the push is amazing. Yeah, um, Signal, um, people at the channel. Like there's just different things, different, yeah, organisations you can check in with. Um, I think Joel just answered that question pretty much as much w real well. But the one thing that I want to add was um, I remember at the push we were doing an electronic music accelerator program which was for young women and non-binary young people in the music industry getting started, making beats and DJing. And, and I remember a lot of young people asking me, oh, I, I got offered this gig at this um, pub on Thursday night you know, at five for two hours, like, I don't know if I should charge them or am I just going to get paid food and 
And it's such a weird scenario because it's like it just depends. For me, it's like how much you want it. Like if you want the practice, like if you want to make a connection, if you want to put something on your social media that says I'm doing a show, if you are going to benefit from it, then I would say cool and they're only offering food. I'd say just take the food because it's like you're actually getting payment in other formats. But after a while, like I think that that's not okay at a certain point and at a certain point if you're not benefiting from it then you say I'd love to I'm 100 bucks an hour I'd love to I'm 50 dollars an hour let me know you know and you always want to keep every bridge open like it's like never be a dick never be ungrateful like be like thanks so much for the offer of your burger for my 17 hour DJ set on Friday night thank you I'm so grateful I'm actually busy that night but please get back to me you know, and then talk about it with your friends like afterwards. But yeah, I think there is a real thing about what can you get out of it as an artist and as a human and um, that's really important to consider. Um, but yeah, the, the other thing, yeah, checking in with other organisations but also checking in with other people. Like I think I'll talk about this quite a lot but I think the thing that sustained me in my music career over 10 years when it hasn't been money, has been my friends. And actually these two people on the stage are two of my best friends. And I work with Joel in like five different projects. We do music stuff all the time. Kim has written countless grants for me. <coughs> like I love them. You not so much. But <laughs> he's cool. Story of my I'm life, sure he'll be, be fine in the end. But it's like fine. to me that connection and those friendships are priceless because I could call Joel at any point and be like, hey – which I do often, like, I got this offer for this thing, it's 2K, what do you think? And we'll, like, debrief about it and be like, cool, it's good because of this and this and this, but it's annoying because it'll take up every day and that's going to take away from this. And I'm like, yeah, 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 oh, oh, I'm not going to do it. So it's like having people who you can check in with who are kind of in a similar world to you is really handy. And that could be on Discord, that could be on a Facebook group. Um, that stuff's really helpful, is fostering community and connections as much as you can. Can I just add to that as well? Of course you can. Um, yeah, jump in. Just in the sort of the, the context of how to value your work, I think it's really good to note that often if you're the artist and you're driving your project and you're the one driving it, often you're the last to get paid if ever and often you're the one investing in it. So if you're pushing a project, even a gig, um, and you're the one hiring the other session musicians and you're – organizing the thing and you're promoting it and doing everything or whether it's an album project and you're making that happen and you're pulling it all together, often you'll be the person who doesn't get paid or is the last to get paid. So in that sense, um, yeah, it's, the, uh, it's not even about valuing your work but it's about, um, yeah, just acknowledging sometimes that that's, yeah, that, that piece. Um, but then at the end of the day, you're the one who has that under your name and has that, owns that, that permanent, I suppose, piece of artistic output, which is other forms of value as well. Yeah, because I think there can be significant return from that in its own right, I imagine, Kim, in terms of like, you know, you may not be, get much back, back much financially from a project when you're paying five, six, you know, artists or, uh, you know, crew or that sort of thing. But if, it, if your name's on the label, um, you know, and, you, you know, if you're, you're there and you're, you're fronting and you're saying, hey, this is my work, I helped put this together, that can lead you to something that maybe will pay you a bit better. Yeah? Yeah, yeah definitely. I think it feels like I'm constantly investing in a small business and that small 100%. business is me. <laughs> but I'm always like, we were just talking about it on the train about, um, yeah, like I got a personal development grant from APRA, which was 15 grand, um, I don't know, maybe four or five years ago. And that was just amazing and I bought a new laptop, I bought a new sound card, I bought a really good microphone. I like totally just reinvested all of that money back into my setup and from then on I it totally upped my game in music making. And so, yeah, I think it's just things like that, the constant kind of reinvestment as well. I think we're gone from the topic now. No, yeah, we're, we're definitely on the topic <laughs> and of course we're on the topic of funding your music career um, hey, just quickly want to touch base. We've got some amazing questions flooding through that we'll get through 
uh, in just a, in just a few uh, minutes shortly. Um, but in terms of uh, making sure you stay on to that, make sure you're checking in with those QR codes. Um, if you're watching at home on the YouTube live stream, make sure you check out the link as well. Uh, that is the push.au slash MIM Slido. Uh, get your questions in. Uh, we'll make sure we'll get we'll make the most out of these guys here C today. Can I, can I just add, actually, um, I really think that for us to tell you our story is really important and to give you a kind of indications, but they're really individual stories. Like every single person in this room is going to have a very individual path to making a living out of music at, to the degree that you invest in it with your time and your commitment. Um, and I'm so down to answer the most specific questions. If you want to ask how much something's worth, how much I make a year, like I'll be as honest as possible because I think that hap doesn't happen very often in music and I think... Um, when you're starting out, you might perceive artists as making either lots of money or not much money. And the truth is somewhere in between that, I think, a lot of the time. So please be as, as brutal and as like, ask us whatever. Or at least me, I'll answer, give you figures. We can treat this like a tax, um, <laughs> a tax meeting if you'd like. like I want you to know that because I didn't have that when I was yeah, coming up. Yeah, please I agree with that so much. Yeah, Transparency yeah. is so powerful. Yeah, yeah. so yeah. powerful. Visibility. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Open Joel's conversations. Right. Having us right now, we're really here for you. Um, so yeah, please. and and I don't think any of the sort of kind of generalized stuff might be as helpful if that makes sense. Like. We can tell you to get on streaming platforms. We can tell you to go on gig lots. We can, you know, but y anyone's going to tell you that. It's like, mm -hmm. let us give you the facts and figures right now if that's what you're into. Otherwise, I can, you know, just say, hey, keep going. It's, music's awesome. Even then, I was saying to my partner, I, I don't know how irresponsible this cl this particular <laughs> talk is, like, <laughs> make a living out of music. Because it's, to be completely honest, it's 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 not easy. So you got to be... I said world of hell. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's not. It's the greatest thing in my life. That was all. We I love just music. I just read a Hans Abing um, article from last year on the train coming in. Um, he's a Dutch what? on the train. Uh, Hans Abing. He's that Dutch um, researcher who has books like Why Are Artists Poor yeah. and um, yeah, yeah, analyzes yeah, yeah. structurally the structural yeah, reasons. Dad, dad. Yeah, 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 totally. And the I think the article is called something like um, you know music an attractive low income profession or something like ridiculous or also true uh, with things like you know musician like artists make 60 percent in general compared to other professions that aren't arts um but yeah it's um it's definitely a reality that is good to keep in mind just mm. good to because i would say that often when you have panels like this i would say it's really good to be aware sometimes that we're actually the exception i would say we're not we're mm. specifically like statistically we're not the rule uh, I think the stats are something like, you know, after 10 years, there'll be maybe 20% left of people who started, mm. whether it's studying or becoming artists across all um, disciplines. So there's a lot of drop off. Mm. So, you know, looking at us, you go, oh, you know, you guys have the most successful, incredible careers, being very adaptable and nimble and flexible and um, hustling when it needs it and successful in so many ways. But I would say it is good to be aware that, uh, you know, this is selection process of, um, yeah, of of amazing exceptions and not mm. it's not always going to be like this. For Can you go majority. again and give us that that author that you you're reading at the moment? Hans Abing. Great. Yeah, I, didn't, I didn't know somebody. B I N G. How is that supposed to spell? Uh, a B B I N G. Amazing. Make sure you check that out. I didn't know an, it was an author writing my two a.m. thoughts, but um, there you go. <laughs> um, it's it's very detailed. It. It's yeah. That's it's, it all free. Um, <laughs> it's not my two a.m. thoughts to be fair. Yeah, no, yeah, no. Yeah. Make sure you check that out, uh, the author out. It's a great resource, I imagine as well. Um, hey, Kim, we'll stick with you. Um, just quickly want to include everyone in the room here. Um, can you chuck your hand up if you've ever attempted to write a grant before or looked into get writing grants? Amazing. That's a lot of people. Amazing. Fantastic. Um, Kim, of course, you, you do a lot of work in, in writing grants specifically. Um, can you offer any advice perhaps to a young artist who's trying to create compa a compelling proposal for a grant or a sponsorship of that kind? So um, I write grants professionally. I work as a full-time arts fundraiser for an arts organisation and I also work with lots and lots of artists. Mm -hmm. But I'm actually going to throw this question to you guys because um, you both have applied for many, many, many grants and as artists, like my perspective is um, I will help an artist on an individual project and sometimes right. on a couple, you know, grants. But I would say maybe you guys might even be best placed as very expert um, grant writers 
um, for your own careers and pro and, and umpteen projects. And I mean, you you've you know been on grant assessment panels as well. So I'm going to throw it back to you guys. Um, so uh, is, is the question like, how do you get a grant, or which grants no, to go for? I guess or more so, you know, what what sort of advice can you offer to someone who's about to approach writing a grant, um, okay. maybe for the first time, perhaps? Rule one: go for every single grant you can. Every uh, every single, single fucking grant. grant, and like get I just out there. I can't even tell you that I've got the. I think well, I don't know what the email is, but they literally is it the Australia Council? They list everything that's coming up, and that can be. Residencies that can be artist grants, that can be community projects, that can be, and just start. You will eventually start to make projects, and you'll be like, oh yeah, that might work for this particular grant. You start to figure out. I don't think. Sometimes I think people make projects just for grants. That's a that's a thing. But I think what you start to do is be able to see the framework in which a project you're doing can fit into a grant, and then it, the more you do that, the more practice you do it, the better it will get. Uh, I think. Two things that are really important is make sure you always call the organisation leading up to putting in an application and talk your application or your idea through with that um, organisation. A, it gives them an idea of what you're doing. They'll help you refine your ideas. Like, they're there to help you. So they want you, you to have the best shot possible. And B, it actually means that if you've got something quite exciting, they'll discuss it in the office. That can help in terms of kind of just, you know, like having people get excited about whatever you're going to submit for. Um, I, I think if you have any um, doubts around how much you should be, again, how much should you be asking for, I think um, it's worth checking in with people who've gotten grants before and just seeing what's realistic because asking for, f you know, if, if a s Creative Victoria has a $15,000 grant for your creative project, and you want to put out one song, the grant panel is going to look at that and go, well, that's a bit much. But vice versa, if you're saying, hey, I want $1,000 to put out my first album, they're going to look at that and go, that's not enough. So there's people on that panel who have done exactly what you're doing and they want to see that you're paying other people, so money's circulating through the community. They want to see that you are charging the right amount of money, that you're actually making realistic ideas of, of what something's worth, like what people's time is worth. And that you can pull it off. That's a really big thing, I, I guess. There's so many things. Grants is so big, but that would be a place to start, I would say. Yeah, I definitely agree with the go for every grant. And like Joel said, yeah, sign up for something that lets you know what grants are available every month. And, yeah, it's like there's residencies and, um, like, Signal around the corner does really great ones. And <coughs> there's just so many and so many for, like, random specific things like um yeah that can be really yeah right for you yeah Please. i would just add to that and say um especially if you're an emerging artist and you haven't applied for grants before um and it can seem a bit daunting i would say it's good to just be aware that grants grant writing is a specialized written application it doesn't necessarily reflect on your art. It doesn't necessarily reflect the value of your art and the skill, mm. the specialised skill that is involved in understanding the sort of grant language. Like on one hand, it is you just write it in plain English and you describe your thing. But on the other hand, it is quite a specialised written skill. Yeah. So um, if you don't get a grant, it doesn't mean you're a bad artist and it doesn't necessarily have any connection to your art really. Um, and because it is this you know, this odd um, written sort of application, um, and, you know, some um, funding bodies now are accepting video and obviously we're all trying to sort of make it more accessible. But it's tricky because there has to be some kind of decision-making process somehow about who gets funded. So I would say if it's new to you, uh, the, yeah, the best thing you could do is try to find some friends who have applied before and really just um, use your friend's experience to demystify that process a bit and workshops and other yeah, sort of organisational supports. calling them, I think, is a Definitely. really good tip. Like, mm. like Joel said... Sorry, Kat, you're... Yeah, but like Josh said, it's like people are there to answer your questions. And I think sometimes when I was first writing them, like you have to really think about what is this grant for? What are these questions asking of me? What is my project in relation sh to this whole other grant world? Like, and you have to... And if you call the people and you talk about it and you say, this is what I want to do and this is the thing that I'm interested in, they'll help you kind of put it in that world because mm. sometimes you're having to reshape a project to make it fit into what they want and if you're not answering all the questions in the way that they kind of 
want to hear it in like the grant kind of language or something sometimes it just can get dismissed so it is really good to like yeah work out what they're asking for and reshape your project oh, I've, got, I've got two more little things to say about that actually is one one is being having been on that on those panels quite quite a lot actually it feels like at the moment it's like a lot of the conversation is about is this person ready to be funded for this project so i think being able to know where you're at and what you need and it all sort of falls to this self-awareness it's like an awareness of your project so that you are also able to say uh, quite specifically what is you know if if if, if there's 40 people that are asking for funding for uh, uh, their first album, what is it about your album that is offering something that is timely, that is unique in its own way, that tells your story and strengthens a community, whether that's the Melbourne music scene or a genre that you're a part of or a uh, just even a, a, a your background, your actual who you are. There is a lot of discussion in those rooms about representation, about people representing themselves and their groups and, and accessibility is is very much something that people are trying to um, correct because I think for a long time and still grants get given to, you know, a lot of people, the same people kind of come through and yes, people with the resources of writing and, and having funding to pay grant writers can have a little bit of an edge and so in those rooms a lot of the discussion is well, Hey, can we can we make sure that there's a really diverse group of people that get funded for this round? So everyone is on your side, and what we're hoping when we read those applications is that you know who you are, you know where you're at in your career, and you know exactly what you want to do with the money that you get. So, yeah, good luck. <laughs> and a tiny thing. Oh, so you want to go first? Okay. Um, which is that um, a real thing to be careful of uh, is burnout from writing grants. Mm. If you're writing the first few, and it can take a lot of momentum to get you over that hurdle of, of getting through that first grant. It might take you a couple of weeks. Often people get quite emotionally involved because you're describing your work and it can oh feel God. quite emotional. That email, thank you for your application. Unfortunately, <laughs> on this event, you are unsuccessful. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and, like, that's the thing. I've, ha we've, I've had so many of the, yeah. the knockbacks, which makes the ones that you get way sweeter. But uh, this is also worth noting is that uh, the federal government and the state government have committed to massive increases in funding for music, music specifically, music and literature in Australia. So there is a period where there'll be more opportunities and you really need to go and try and find out what those opportunities are for you and which ones are going to be applicable. Mm, I think the thing with, um, I think what you were saying about knowing who you are and where you're at is really important. Like, you know, if you are between 18 and 25, mm. signal city of melbourne i don't know why i keep mentioning them it's just because they're just there but that's a really good one to apply for because that is like your demographic you know finding those things is really helpful and like local council like marybeck offers a lot like i know city of yarra offers them like there's places that i didn't realize offered grants for ages and i was like oh wow cool so, so it's really a, a game of like find the opportunities where you can and you were talking about um, asking the or answering the specific questions and the facts and stuff. I would say, as a professional grant writer who's written hundreds of applications, um, I probably am successful for like one in five applications. And I also work with people who are like good mates who help me with the things I'm not as good at, at where they're really good at it, like budgets and stuff. Or if it's a touring grant, I often get help with that as well. But despite that, maybe one in four, one in five, like there's a lot that um, I wouldn't get as well. Um, and often it's it's not necessarily how good the application is, but again, who's like who else is in that pool of applicants? Is it the right? Are there you know forty people applying for an album um, recording, and are there um, how do they yeah sort of spread that diverse um, types of projects that get funded? Yeah, I think it's good to know. We love grants. <laughs> it's clear to say we've had a lot of grant experience. Grant well, is actually my middle name. Is it really? Yeah, it's so Scottish. Yeah. <coughs> I've got. Amazing. I have a lot of grants. Yeah. M must explain why you're why you're so good. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Grant, grant funding. writing is mine. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> what was your what was your middle name, Joel? Uh, my middle name. What is my middle name? It's like synthesizer. <laughs> <laughs> synthesizer. <laughs> grant nice. Getter. Nice, yeah. nice. Good musicians here. Yeah. Uh, talking some grant writing. We're talking uh, funding your music. Uh, we're going to indulge in some of your questions in, in just a second uh, here, so make sure you get them through 
uh, on Slido. There's QR codes around the room if you're in the room and want to ask anonymously. Um, and also uh, there is a, a website as well, the push.au slash M-I-M Slido. I'm looking that way because that's the closest one that I can read. Um, but yeah. Um, no, uh, we, we will indulge in those uh, in just a second. I really, really want to quickly and want make it a quick a quick answer here. I want to indulge personally before I let you guys indulge. Um, there's a, a J. Cole line. I don't know if anybody's familiar with J. Cole at all. Uh, there's a song called 1985, and there's a lyric in that uh, that says, I got some good advice, never quit touring, because that's the way we eat here in this rap game. Joel, as a creative within the hip-hop landscape, can you speak to that particular lyric and if, if there's any truth to that as an artist? Obviously, Joe J. Cole is at an international, you know, like widespread t uh, touring level. But even as a as a l local artist, uh, is there any way you can speak to, you know, that's how money comes in as an artist and to keep touring and keep trying to push gigs and things like that? Uh, yeah, I think. I mean, one thing about the American hip hop industry and the in and like parts of the world where there's bigger populations, it's easier to tour consistently because you've got more places to go and tour. Whereas Australia point. is not a big distances, very expensive to fly and to or drive, very time consuming. And then there's just, you know, there's only what, like five major cities. And so if you're doing a, a national tour, you can be done after five dates, really. If you take in a few of the regionals, then maybe you can get a 10-date tour. If you take in a lot of the regionals, maybe you can get a 20-date tour. But that's pretty light on in comparison to what European tours look like and American tours look like. Do I think that that is still a valuable and viable or the most money made in music? I think for a small tier of people it is. Like it's a very relevant a way of making a living and an income, but you're putting all of your eggs into being an artist, being the name on the bill, the name in lights, the person who pulls the people, you have the pressure of, you know, of, of having to attract an audience because that's what you do when you tour. You need to sell tickets. Um, I think that there is a lot of other ways of making money now. I think sync is probably the last... Like, publishing would be the last big money, like, kind of dinosaur music money. Does everyone know what that is? Let's let's break that down. But so, when a song gets put onto a TV commercial or a TV show or a film, uh, there's two fees that get paid. One is for the recording, and one is for the um, intellectual copyright. And so, if you, it's usually called a side. So something might, for instance, the last sync that we got was for a track that we wrote, which was five thousand US. Um, it's not a, it's not heaps, but that was a nice little sync that we got. That's five thousand for the recording, and then another five thousand for was it five 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 and five, five thousand for the recording, and then five thousand for the um, intellectual copyright for the publishing. Our publisher will take fifty percent of our publishing side until we've paid off our advances, in respectively, have different advances, and then um, if we have a label for that project, they will take whatever they take from the master side, where self uh, self releasing this particular project so it means we'll take 100% of that um, 50% if that makes sense um, let's just break down how many sinks I've had this year and this is an honest account so uh, we also got a one for a thousand US which was on the same project um, can I divulge Heiko Hand stuff Heiko Hand's got the 75 for, for the Can Canadian ad 75 for that I got 80 for a, a ad from Westpac for a solo track. Um, this is all in the last 12 months. Uh, there's been a few Haiku Hands ones. Um, I know that Mo, Moju got, um, I had 25% on Native Tongue and I got, she got a think a 10K sync for a TV show that's coming out on the ABC. So all up I would say generally if I was to break down um, one of, the areas that I make money, sync is now probably makes up, I'd say, a third of my income a year from music. And um, how does that happen? You need a publisher. So for anyone who is serious about not just being a performing artist but wants to be a writer, that should be one of your goals is to, be, to try and attract and sign a publishing deal so you have a team of people who are out there working for your music. It also takes a little bit of the pressure off having to tour and fill rooms like J. Cole. And J. Cole, I love J. Cole, but, you know, I don't know if taking a billionaire's advice on career moves is ever a good idea. Um, he's doing really well and Believe props that. to him. But I think in Australia it's a lot harder to tour and make money like that. I, I was telling B that the two main performing projects... I've got 
maybe three main performing projects. TZU, Joel Listics, and then I was in a theatre show. And the theatre show made way more money than the music shows. Not way more, but like comparatively speaking was a lot safer. The two music projects at their peak were, were – one of them, TZU, was asking 20K for a show. We would do maybe 20 gigs a year, 20, 25 gigs a year. We would still, I would say, in those years, uh, individually in the band, only make about twenty-five to thirty thousand dollars a year in terms of from that project. That's a somewhat at its peak was quite a successful consid considered quite a successful project. But the overheads, the amount of money you're paying out to tour in Australia, you've got flights, you've got hire cars, you've got accommodation, you've got band if you have band, like backline if you need backline. There is so many costs associated with touring. Yes, you could maybe look at touring or maybe just let's pull it down a couple of notches and you're out there just gigging doing maybe cover shows and maybe doing weddings and that's a fucking viable option and I know a lot of working musicians who make a living from playing weddings literally they've got a couple of artistic projects but they make their living from playing weddings where they get paid roughly a thousand dollars a show you know um, for the whole band so let's say whatever six thousand um, dollars because they're not having to write the songs and blah 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 so yes it is a possibility that J. Cole is right for J. Cole. And it is possible that some of you in this room might end up having that kind of career. But I would highly recommend you look at a bunch of other income streams as well as that um, to survive. And now, also post-pandemic, it's harder to fill rooms. Festivals are shutting down. It's getting tougher. And so, as, we was, as I think the five-year rule, it's like that's the, this five-year period, I think that's one of the streams that's really changing is like... Live music is just not the m not the game it was, and so there's other games you've got to find the game and adapt. Joel, thank you for humouring my silly hip hop question. I appreciate all it. All good, all good. <laughs> J Cole's not silly. No, he's not silly. He's not silly. But in the context of the conversation, yeah. I just wanted to humour myself. Uh, speaking of humouring, we're going to humour some of you guys and, and answer some of these questions we've got here on Slido. Um, and yeah, we'll, we'll get we'll get around to it and get some questions. So make sure you get them in. Um, I'm going to try and flood through. There's a bunch here, but I'm, I'm going to go to, to some that I think we may not have touched on or that we can probably um, unpack a little bit more as well. Uh, so there's one right here at the top that says, what are your thoughts, uh, from an an anonymous person, what are your thoughts on the minimum performance fee of 250 Do you think it's a fair amount? Do you think as musicians we should be holding payers to this? Did you guys know there was a minimum pay fee? Yeah, I, there was a oh. talk when I, I remember being on a panel at for Creative Victoria, no, for uh, Music Victoria, and we were talking about like what would a unionized amount of money be for a session musician? Like, what's the bottom fee? And I think, f <coughs> I think it was, I think it got to maybe it was at two fifty or three hundred dollars. Um, so uh, if you were to sort of take that as a unit of work, which is um, for someone who's coming in to sit in on a band or um, maybe it's a solo artist who's getting uh, playing guitar in a, in a cafe or a restaurant or something. Um, I think it's, 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 it's never just that one hour of work. It's the practice, it's the rehearsal, it's the 20 odd years of learning your instrument or perfecting your craft. Like, there's so much in the background that you're also getting paid for. And so anytime a promoter or a venue or someone says, hey, oh, but it's only, you know, 15 minutes of your time, it's actually not. It's so much more than that. And never fall for that that whole logic. Is 250 uh, a decent amount? It is, again, it's like context is everything. Like, how long are they playing? What's the rider? What's the uh, what's what's the travel time? Um, do they have to pay for a band? Do they? You know, there's so many things. A DJ or whatnot. Uh, anonymous. I hope you're um, able to start there and then see how it might step up or work for you. So, yeah, the hourly rate thing is really it's really hard to gauge. It's an interesting one as an artist, isn't it? Yeah. Um, I, for a little bit of insight, I, I do a bit of emceeing work on the side, aside from my day job, and trying to, to price that is because there's little to, to no information online about how much you pay a wedding MC or, or a function MC. So to try and price that, you're essentially just pricing the value of my ability to speak into a microphone, which is 
some of you might say not very good tonight, but like I think that's an interesting aspect to, to grasp as you, it's you're almost deciding your own self worth and are you worth three hundred dollars an hour uh, for yeah. for a session? You know, it's interesting. Uh, um, it, there is also, I mean, for everyone out there and all the stuff that we're talking about, I think there's oh there's there's nothing more empowering than saying no to something as well. Like it's really good to be able to say. Actually, you know what? My time or my energy is worth more than this, whatever's being offered, the 250 or the whatever it is or the free gig that's going to get you a hamburger. Like sometimes you've got to say no and there's, it's, it's quite um, satisfying to, to be empowered by that. Hey, we got another question here. Uh, I'm going to go to Washington. I'm going to quickly double check. I'm gonna is Washington in the room with us at all? Washington, amazing. Awesome. Thanks, Washington. So you have someone to look to. Uh, Washington has just asked that he believes that artists, um, that our biggest obstacle tends to be our own limiting beliefs. How do you each learn to overcome imposter syndrome? Michael, do you be for this one? Go. Therapy. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, I think for me personally, that's like a lifelong journey. Uh. Like I think, I mean, I remember when I was studying... Um, Oh, there was some crazy guy on Hey Hey at Saturday. Uh, One? So he was like an old old guy. Musician? White guy, yeah. Oh, Red Simon. Maybe it was Red Simon, but yeah, wasn't it? Was yeah. Like <laughs> <laughs> um, anyway. <laughs> Beep. And um, he came and did a talk at an MIT when I was studying, when I was quite young, and um, he was just like... I just say yes to everything like you know he got offered a movie where he had to be a musician in the background and he had to play guitar and they were like can you do that and he was like yeah yeah hell yeah and then he like walked away and was like how to play guitar like he just saying yes to everything and I still do that I'm doing that right now with like one of the biggest composing jobs I've ever done that I absolutely am not good enough for but I'm just saying yes to it and then I'm making it work and I think that um, – I actually think that, yeah, like all this talk about money and how to get income is so important. But the thing that to me is the most important is that how do you make music for yourself long term? And I think that we can have all these conversations about different ways to get income. But if you want to get a job at a supermarket, so you're going to have your rent paid, so you don't have to worry about all this stuff, so you can just make guitar, like just play guitar and enjoy it or make beats or whatever, then that's your path. Like you just have to try to find the thing that allows you to keep making music for yourself firstly and then for all of this other stuff. And um, I think the imposter syndrome is... Um, it's real. I don't. I don't know how um, you ever get over it. I, I like had this really beautiful experience in COVID where I didn't know when w any band would tour again or what music was for. And, and I actually started playing music for myself for the first time, like so deeply in years. And it was such a good experience. And I actually feel like I have this, like companion or friend with me for life that no matter how crap my life is or how crazy the world is like I have something that I can turn to to help process feelings and even though I don't Joel, <laughs> Joel and I were parking my car and there was all these people walking across the road and we're like look at them with their jobs and their stable incomes and <laughs> they're all probably just having a beer after work because they know when their check's coming in we're just <laughs> we're just joking we're joking about music income but like I think like if that's what works for them that's what works for them but sometimes my payment is that I don't have to set an alarm in the morning I pick my work hours I get to work with my best friends I get to tour the world I can't afford to buy a house right now um, but I'm relatively happy like and I'm, I'm so privileged that I'm able to do that and um, so yeah I kind of diverged but I definitely think the imposter syndrome is is part of the deal for me and I'm happy Facts. just to <laughs> yeah, I'm happy just to no write, write about it as well like it's that's part of my art like that's like part of my process of working out who I am as a human and what I want to say and what I want to contribute um yeah. It's harder to answer having friends. Uh, yeah, yeah sure. they're all right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I reckon it. that everyone in this room ha has 
imposter syndrome, and that's why you're an artist. Like that's yeah. the whole, that's the balance, right? Literally like you in have our that because you want to create and process the world through some medium of art and exchange. And just to what Kim was saying about where the exception, I think the the stories of musicians and producers and artists that I've seen who who went on to do other things. They stopped trying to make a living off music. Um, some of them did it m for mental health reasons because music was so stressful that it made them unhappy. And so um, for some th of those people, they just stopped playing music altogether. Um, that's, their, that's, that's the decision they made. For some people, though, they kept on playing music. For me and for the people that I know who still persist and still make money, still have some years that are great and some years that are less great and just, you know, you're, you're kind of, you know, you're winning but you're also like, whoa, what the fuck? And, um, <laughs> you know, f I think you have to at some point start to invest in your mental health plan and in, by that I mean you have to protect <laughs> your inspiration, you have to protect the people around you, you have to be able to... Um, front up with all of your, you know, at Christmas time with your auntie saying, so have you got a real job yet? Like you have to go through all that and you have to protect the music and it's really important and that's how you'll, that's how you'll keep going because it's the cynicism and the burnout is like, that's a thing. And, and so is the imposter syndrome and so is the lack of gigs. And so, you know, it's, it's like, it's a jungle out there. And so really like, you know, if you're going to, do this, then um, keep twenty percent of your energy for yourself, and don't let the world go and take that from you somehow. Whether that's like knowing when to shut off from social media, knowing when to say no to a gig, or knowing when the gig is just for f to feel good. Like I do a beat night once a month. I get, you know what I get paid? A, j a really nice Japanese meal, and and I get to hang out with my friends, and we get to play our you know, sketch beats or the beats that we're working on, it's just a good hang. And I'm not putting the pressure on that gig to to pay me. And so it's about knowing like what you're where you're putting your energies, like and what's where it's coming back. And I think, yeah, to come back to the imposter syndrome thing, like enjoy it in a weird way. Like it's that all that doubt and struggle is like that's the good shit to write from. Like that's what you've got. So you know, I mean, there's the very few personalities in music who are just like uber confident and sort of <coughs> Marvel level superhero egos. And, you know, that I don't know Plenty if that works. Plenty of narcissists in the music industry. <laughs> totally, but I just don't know if that really works. So it's not, I don't know. Surface I'm, level, surface level. Yeah, nice. yeah. So it's, it's a weird, I mean, I come from hip hop, dude. I mean, I, we, we know about that, but it's like, it's like the, the, Boy, the fifth we? element. <laughs> but yeah, I just don't, I think the doubt is. Um, is 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 actually a good tool. I have a slightly different take on this. Please. Unless you have a question. No, no. Okay. Um, so as an artist manager, um, I am in a supporting role for pretty much all the projects I work on, um, and um, you know, very comprehensive kind of supporting role from fundraising, writing about it, marketing, promotion, producing, creative direction, and everything. So I'd have d I actually don't have much of a connection to the imposter syndrome because I'm not the person on the stage. So as the supporting role, I have no problem describing with 100% confidence how amazing these projects are, how amazing the people are, all this stuff. And I, I fully believe, otherwise I wouldn't be working with them, that they are the best project ever, the best artist ever. This is the most important thing for the world. I genuinely believe that because that's the projects you know I work on. It's what I choose to work on. So I would say that one little option in an ideal world is that you would have a team mm. which allows you, to, which creates a bit of space for you to sit in the imposter syndrome and have space for you to, to hold that. Uh, without uh, you know, with with just the the yeah the luxury of being able to have that while they protect that space around you, mm -hmm. and do the other pieces which involve um, which is if easy for them to not have to deal with imposter syndrome, but do all those things which often need being done like describing it as the most amazing thing. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, there's plenty of other things. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's a really good point actually. You don't want to let anyone else know you have imposter syndrome. <laughs> 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 no, everyone but has no, imposter syndrome. Yeah, I know, yeah. but it's like you have to back yourself professionally in a weird way of like um yeah like what joel said it sounds feels really good to say no sometimes or 
yeah, like know your worth. Like as an artist, you you as an artist have something unique to offer and that's worth something. Um, so, yeah, you can have it inside you creatively, but when you're applying for the grant, that is not the time mm. to show it. <laughs> mm. Oh, yes, that, that is a good point. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's a fair point. Um, hey, hey, Washington, thanks for the question, my friend. It's yeah. a really good insight. We love to talk, so... <laughs> um, and another thing. Yeah. No. Hang on, I'm not <laughs> I, do, I do actually want to add one thing to that, which is like... <laughs> I reckon the other thing about music is, and, and it's, the, it's the probably the reason that, you know, most people I know uh, who are in music, I really like them as people because they, it's really different to sport. It's like, it's not competitional, no one wins, no one loses, but it's really easy to compare where you're at with, you know, so-and-so who also is doing the thing you're doing and sometimes people are ahead, sometimes they're behind. Um, and I reckon one of the other things in your 20% mental health plan is just don't compare. Just don't get into that yeah. business of like, but that and, you know, I should be or this should have and da, 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 da. It's like that's, what did Rick Rubin call it? It's low vibrational energy to put competition into music, I think. Your journey so is your journey. 100%. I actually watched a cool thing the other day that was talking about if you're going to do that being competition with yourself. So it's like, cool, the next show that I do, instead of feeling... Um, inferior to the person who played before me, I'm just going to think, have I done a better show than my show mm. last time? And I did. I had a great show on Sunday in Sydney. Like I was like, oh, I did that thing and I've never done that before and I was chuffed. And it's just like that yeah, kind right. of stuff is cool to try to flip your mindset. Yeah. It is very cool. And um, what also is very cool is pizza, which we'll get to. Uh, very, very shortly. Yeah, you're like, shut um, up. We can yeah. no, 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 pizza. No, <laughs> we no. We can not And another quite, thing. Quite the opposite. Quite the opposite. It's been a fantastic insight, I'm sure, for everyone here, people uh, watching at home and for me as well. Um, I'm going to push you guys to give us uh, maybe two takeaways, um, maybe a line or two, uh, just because we, we do have pizza on the way and I'm quite hungry. Um, I'll, I'll go to Joel first. One takeaway that people can take from this conversation about funding your music career. Okay. Um, so uh, the first one would be um, to um, try and imagine that the money that you make or the money that you want to make is connected to the community that you're building. So uh, what are you strengthening around and who is who are you investing in other than yourself? Like who else is a part of the thing that you're doing? If you eat and everyone eats what, like, who else is eating? And what are you trying to kind of make for all of you, for all of us? Um, and I think when you can try, sort of go down that road, then I think somehow the money sort of starts to take care of itself a little bit, not entirely. Maybe that's one takeaway. The other takeaway would be don't let five years of tax go undone. <laughs> Speaking from experience, uh, it's a real bummer, and like it's a real bummer. So it just feels like life advice. <laughs> yeah, but I think a lot of musos and songwriters, and you know, I mean, look again, we're creative people. Like we let some of the life admin shit just fall by the side, and that's part of the you know that's part of the um, workplace benefits that we get, I guess. Um, but the, there's some things that you just kind of you don't want to let go. I mean, and I actually tax is probably the least, but like your relationships with the people around you because you might have a partner or parents or a brother or a sister or someone who is, you know, kind of supporting you and you don't know they're supporting you. And so I think it's really important that you invest back into that relationship as well and sort of that's just as important. I have this, yeah, I do have a theory that it's like we're sort of taught that the artist is at the top of some kind of pyramid and then there's this top-down scheme and I don't think that's how it is. I think that often there's this entire group of people around an artist, whether that's other artists or the people that they love and the people who fucking cook dinner for them or whatever it is that you need, that you needed, you know, when to, to pick yourself up off the floor to write another song. Like, they're really important and so um, it's a good way to keep your ego in check. So that's, that's another thing. Thank you very much. Kim, we might go to you. Oh. Yeah, throw two it out of the order. Two takeaways? Yeah, we'll go okay. two takeaways. Um, so one of them is related to what you said, mm. which is that specifically in terms of funding your music career, the music industry is a relationship-based industry. Mm. Oh, God, so small. It, it's, that's, yeah. yeah. 
enough said, yeah. uh, but I can't emphasize that enough. Um, and everything, support, friends, money, everything, opportunities comes from that. Um, second thing is, um, wait, can we go to you? I had yeah. one, but no, I just actually Let's go to you. I just want to give an example of that. Artie, who works for the Push, who is literally the best person in the world. Give us away, Artie. Do you remember me applying for grants? So I would call <laughs> Artie at Creative Victoria and be so stressed. And was I rude? <laughs> oh, great. See, I was never rude. <laughs> and you, that you now rude. I work with Artie and I applied for a job at the Push. And it's like you just – the same people come up all the time. Like the bar person who wrote – you wrote to about DJing for 17 hours for a burger is probably in the music industry as well and they will end up on some panel reading your thing and being like, oh, I remember when that person – it is insane. I remember when I first like worked it out and started to go to industry stuff and I was just like, oh, that guy was wasted last time. And I, instead of being like, you're wasted, I was like, hello, <laughs> person. Like, you know, just like just – it's so weird because it's such a – not a professional industry but it actually – it's, uh, it's it basically to me it feels like an island of people who all love music – most people are underpaid and most people are just doing it for the love and so you just have to give love into that space and you'll eventually get it back. That's very accurate. And I remembered my thing, um, which is that um, as you're pursuing a music career, just make sure that you really look after yourself as well financially. Um, don't drop all of your other paid work to pursue a career in music before it's financially viable. Um, I think statistically professional artists spend about 40% of their time not on their art. So even successful artists often will, you know, have other sort of forms of income. I feel like hybrid artists is a word I've heard sort of more recently about combining, um, you know, uh, commercial or business um, activities that are related to the art along with your sort of creative art stuff. So I would say I think it's for, for mental health, for stability, for all sorts of reasons when you're in an industry that is so freelance, short-term contracts, um, up and down, um, feast and famine, the income will often come in in big bursts and then it won't come for a while. Whereas like, <coughs> sorry, rent is, you know, regular and bills are regular. So I would just say make sure that you're really looking after yourself in terms of baseline income and living expenses so that you take care of yourself and if you take care of yourself then the people around you also are sort of taken care of and not stressed and stuff and i think that's pretty important b do you have just one takeaway left i do i feel like i've talked a lot does anyone have a quick question that's like we didn't get to ask very many yes I have like a question. yeah oh. quick yeah. yes so as a songwriter you yeah like sharing that with other musicians and yeah Yeah, I think so. Oh, so you're a, you're a songwriter, and you're writing for other artists. Is that what you kind of mean? Yeah, great. Hey, could we catch this question afterwards? Because the guys are going to be hanging around, obviously, we can. having some pizza. Let's pick that up. That's, that's very specific pizza. and We're it's a good We're going to get up and, and have some pizza because yeah, yeah. we don't want the pizza to get cold. Or, or do we? I don't know. Um, no. Anyway, no. Um, the pizza, we won't let the pizza get cold. But uh, what was your name? Sorry, man? Hans? Hans. Hans uh, we're going to link you with B and yeah, B's yeah. going to answer your question we'll for sure completely. For sure. Um, but with that being said, can we get a round of applause for our guests today? <laughs> yeah, it's a pleasure. Uh, before we get up and have a pizza, can we get everyone to stand up for me, please? Oh, uh, including our lovely panellists as well. Everyone stand up. Uh, big stretch, ring out your arms. I'm a theatre nerd if you can't tell, so this is a theatre thing. Um, Awesome, great. We've got Jim as especially coming in to perform as well. So we're going to have a performance, of course. Um, so there'll be plenty of grooving as well that you can shake out all that long sitting you, you've just done for. Um, but yeah, otherwise, please make your, file your way out through that way. Uh, Lisa and Artie are there. Uh, we'll guide you out. Thank you. Thanks so yeah. much, guys. Grab some Good pizza. Good luck. Amazing.
Okay. Okay. If you can hear me in the foyer, uh, let's make our way back in. Uh, if we can, uh, we'll get ready for our uh, incredible... Ooh, lights are on. Get ready for our incredible artist shortly. Uh, we'll give some folks uh, some time just to walk in uh, and get set up. Um, and we'll, we'll throw it to our artist shortly. Yep. Keep making your way in. Come on in. There we go. Come on in. Easy way back in. Meander over. Waddle on in. Uh, keep waddling. Keep waddling. Come on in. Welcome back. Welcome back. We're about to get uh, an incredible artist, uh, JHM, to come on. Keep waddling. Keep waddling. Joel, how was the pizza? Joel's just given me... Uh, what do you call that? The... The, that's an okay. That's an okay. Um, and then he gave me a chef's kiss. Um, I don't know whether it's okay or whether it was chef's kiss now, but there we are. Anyway, keep waddling back in. You can bring your pizza with you if you've not finished. Don't feel like you have to rush the carb down your throat. Um, it's uh, absolutely fine. Come on, bring some pizza in. I'm sure, I'm sure JHM would love the smell of pizza while she's performing. Um, so we'll, we'll keep that in mind as well. Um, keep waddling on in. Come on. Just about to get JHM to, to perform here. I'm loving all the networking going, though. I'm seeing a lot of socializing, a lot of networking. It's really, really good to see. I'm really stoked about it. Really, really stoked about it. Good stuff. There's Robert. Robert, how you doing? I'm just saying hello, that's all. Um, we'll keep bringing some folks back in. If you are hearing, you probably, probably can hear me, hopefully. Uh, we're just about to get a live performance in, so we'll, we'll get you started now. Um, amazing. With that being said, uh, I'd like to welcome on our lovely, our lovely friend uh, and artist that's going to perform for us now, uh, JHM. Give her a round of applause, folks. You're welcome. Welcome. How you doing? Good. How's the pizza? It's good. It smells good. <laughs> I go by JHM. I'm gonna play you guys some songs. These are amongst some of the like strangest songs I've ever written, in all honesty. Um, there's a lot of. I usually play with a full band, so you guys are gonna have to help me out a lot in terms of like keeping the beat and stuff. This first one is a song called Rely on Love. I wrote this when I was like 17. About um, someone I had a crush on. <laughs> and I thought it was in love because everything feels like that at that age, yeah. Um, so for this song, I know a lot of you guys are holding plates, but do what you can, help me out. I just need a click going like this. Uh-huh. Let's go. Yeah. Keep me away from here. Mm -hmm. 
Don't you think that I know what you're doing to me, baby? Mm. And it's turning me green, green. Ooh, I can't, yeah, yeah. Oh, ooh, 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 ooh. Instead, I just don't care. Ooh, my mama told me I should never, ever, ever rely on love. It's the story of one girl who lost her way. Sorry for some girl who lost her brain to you, her name to you. Yeah. I'll never, ever, ever rely on love. Mm -hmm. Never rely on love. La, 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 la. I said, don't ever, ever, ever rely on love. It's the story of one girl who lost her way. Sorry for some girl who lost her brain to you, her name to you. You, 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 you. Don't ever, ever, ever rely on love. Never rely Thank you guys so, so much. This next song, this is a happier song, actually. Do any of you guys sing? Anyone sings in this room? Yeah? OK. Well, you guys are all going to sing soon, so. <laughs> yeah, exactly. This song doesn't have a name yet, but if anyone thinks of one, let me know. It goes like this. I had a dream that you would meet me. Love on the beach, we talked to sea shells about the way that we were meant to be, about the way that you were made for me. Honestly, you would seem more likely, feel like a glove, uh, think I'm in trouble, think I'm in love, feels like enough to lost a life supply and dopamine, lost inside a screen, you make me feel living in a movie. Thought that you should know, my dear, I love you so like chocolates and roses every single time I see you on the weekend, see you on the weekday, see you every day. I hope you like your eggs on toast, your coffee cold, your nights been fighting for the covers till you pull me closer. No, you won't let go. And that's the way I know what I already know. I guess I love this song. So if it seems mm, like I'm elusive, no, it don't mean I want to lose this. Sometimes I get lost inside my head. Like, but I trust that you know to bring me back. Don't I let you in now and then? Compromise some of the time, make amends again and again. Don't I put you for show you? I'm her, show you my worst. So that the best seems ever said, I'm trying to, my dear. To love you in the style you recognize So I hope that you know, my dear I love you so like chocolates and roses Every single time I see you on a weekend See you on a weekday, see you every day I hope you like your airs on toast and your coffee cold Your nights been fighting for the covers Till you pull me closer, no, you won't let go and that's the way I know what I already know. I guess I love this song. Okay, so usually when I play this, the whole audience, you guys have to sing. Da 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 da
Yeah, they're here. Nice. And you gotta keep it going, because I wanna sing the chorus over it. Let's go. Your eggs on toast, your coffee cup, your nice bit. Fight it for the covers till you pull me closer. Nah, you won't let go. And that's the way I know it. I already know. I guess I love this song. Yeah. <laughs> and now you slow it down. Slow it down. Good job. <laughs> this next one, this is a song I wrote about someone who stole my keys. Wow, crimes. <laughs> it was pretty bad. It's expensive to get your keys replaced. Um, yeah. You gotta listen to the lyrics. This is a song about someone who wrote my keys. So, stole my keys. And I wrote a song about it. Here we are again. Me closing one other door, wondering how the two of us got left. Stuck either side of a highway, I ruled the day we ever met. Wish I could forget that you and I saw eye to eye. I wish you all the best if you just give me back my keys. Mm -hmm. Because there's something that's how I need. Mm -hmm. I know you wear them round your neck. Cause you're alternative, but I don't give a <laughs> Heard from your mother's friend. You're acting up, you're waking up in somebody else's bed. Hope they providing your rent in the morning. All I want is what was mine. And all you do is waste my time. You're crying on my name online. That's fine. But please just give me back my keys. Uh, because there's something that I need. Mm -hmm. I know you wear them round your neck. Cause you're alternative, but I don't give up. you guys so 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 much this is the last song of the set this is a song called island and i'm about to put it out maybe sometime early next year um thank you so much to yeah the push to all the panelists to yeah everyone involved lisa for having me this thing is crazy like the fact that this is something that we can just come to is like unbelievable. I was just like, yeah, sitting there and feeling honestly like every word was so relevant to me. Like this is so, this, this like the push and what it does for music is unbelievable, honestly. And the fact that it's free, like crazy. Um, so yeah, thank you guys. Thank you guys for being here, for listening to me. I go by JHM. You can find me on socials and stuff. This is called Island and you guys are gonna have to sing as well. Just a warning. <laughs> Mm-hmm. 
Forty degrees outside, room with a view. Portraits of you in lilac and blue, and one thing I choose is drinking my hand tonight. Plus, wall up against the sky. You got it confused. I'm waiting for you, waiting to make a move. To the left, go right. Side to side till midnight, they labo gray goose. Tell me two times what there is to lose. So sway, maybe we'll run away. We're making plans like Paris and DR to Spain. Still, I never asked for your name. So you're an island girl, and from all I heard, you got it going on. Cause you're an island girl from a different world. And so I wrote this song. Cause you're an island girl made from diamond girl. You know my heart is strong. Cause I'm an island girl from an island jar. Why don't you sing along? Like la 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 la, la 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 la, la 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 la. La 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 la, la 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 la, la 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 la. La 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 la, la 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 la, la 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 la. La 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 la, la 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 la, la 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 la. So we danced all day, and then we danced all night. No pride, getting high on tomorrow. We I'll never know your way. We I'll never know your brain. It's okay, because for now there's other things on my mind. We move to the left, go right. Side to side till midnight, lay labo, gray goose. Tell me two times what there is to lose. So sway, uh, maybe we'll run away. We're making plans like Paris and DR to Spain. Still, I never asked for your name. So you're an island girl, and from all I heard, you got it going on. Cause you're an island girl from a different world. And so I wrote this song. Cause you're an island girl, made from diamond girl. You know my heart is strong. Cause I'm an island girl from an island jar. Why don't you sing along like la 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 la, la 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 la, la 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 la. La 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 la, la 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 la, la 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 la. Hey, la 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 la. We go la 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 la, if only for the weekend, la 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 la, if only for the night, la 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 la, and we pause the point of pretend, la 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 la, while well, we keep on thinking, twice la 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 la, stays in the weekend, la 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 la, written in the stars, la 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 la, la 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 la, la 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 la. Cause you're an island girl, and from all I heard, you got it going on. Cause you're an island girl from a different world, and so I wrote this song. Cause you're an island girl, made from diamond girl, you know my heart is strong. Cause I'm an island girl from an island jar, why don't you sing along? Thank you guys so, so much. Well done to you, well done to yourselves. There's clearly a lot of musicians in this room. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. That's, um, that's pretty much it, guys. Thanks so much for coming. Uh, make sure you follow JHM socials. Uh, follow the Push Inc. Uh, on Instagram as well. Sin Media, S-Y-N Media. Um, and yeah, we'll see you at the next one. Cheers. Woo! <laughs> Get it. Thank you. Thank you for having me. My voice is so bad. Are you kidding me? You carried that. You carried it. I was like, I can hear it. Um, yeah, actually.